Thank you for your patience. Uh, before I take your questions, I just had one announcement to make. To honor the victims of Monday's horrific shooting at the Washington Navy Yard, the President will attend a memorial service on Sunday. We will provide more details uh, as they become available, but I wanted you to know that today. Where that would be. Again, more details about the time, the specific time on Sunday and, and where the service will be, uh, will become available uh, soon. But at, I just wanted to let you know uh, today that the President will be attending a memorial service for the victims on Sunday. You anticipate speak or just attend? Again, I don't have uh, uh, anything more on that. I think uh, the President will want to uh, mourn the loss of these innocent victims uh, and uh, share in the nation's pain in the aftermath of another senseless mass shooting. Julie. Thanks, Jay. Um, now that we have a <coughs> clear sense of the trajectory in the House on, the, on their budget plan, does the administration think the fact that they're taking this approach and the fact that they are probably not going to vote, it sounds like, until Friday? Does that make the possibility of a government shutdown more likely at this point? I hope not. But as I think we saw in the reporting today, uh, House Republicans have decided to pursue a path away from the center, away from compromise, uh, in favor of voting on a piece of uh, legislation that they know will not become law. And, uh, you know, one, one uh, sobering paragraph I read in one story about this, I think in the Washington Post, was that members of both parties are becoming increasingly worried that the fact that a faction of the House of Representatives, the House Republicans, is uh, driving this thing in the wrong direction uh, could bring us closer to a wholly unnecessary and damaging shutdown of the government. And, uh, you know, Congress has uh, some basic responsibilities. One of them is to fund the government, the operations of the government. And uh, it is not to attach ideological aspirations to the kinds of bills that ensure that the government doesn't shut down and uh, that we don't inflict another unnecessary wound on our economy just as it's continuing to grow and continuing to create jobs. And, you know, what has become more and more apparent uh, is that uh, the leaders of the Republican Party in the Congress may want to avoid a shutdown and may want to avoid, even worse, a default. Uh, but there are members of that party, especially in the House, who seem to embrace the prospect. Uh, and the irony is uh, that they are doing it in the name of trying to defund or delay or defeat in some other way a law designed to provide access to insurance for millions of Americans, to health insurance, a law that is already providing tangible be benefits to millions of Americans. A law, as I said the other day, that when implemented will ensure that at least uh, close to six in ten uninsured Americans will now have the capability of buying insurance for less than a hundred dollars a month. Uh, that law was passed by the House, it was passed by the Senate, it was signed by the President, and it was upheld by the Supreme Court. And yet, uh, in order to refight this political battle, some members of uh, the Republican Party in Congress uh, you know, seem to want to have shut down the government and maybe have, for the first time in the history of this great country, uh, see the United States fail to pay the bills that it's already incurred. Does the White House uh, so this is, the, this is a problem, and we have to be crystal clear about the fact that there is a majority in Washington, uh, a, a member of which is the President of the United States, a member of which is 
uh, every Democrat on Capitol Hill, and a member of which are many Republicans on Capitol Hill, who do not want to see the government shut down, who do not want to see the pain inflicted of, that a shutdown would inflict on the middle class, and uh, will not negotiate over the ideological aspirations of a small a group, or a, unfortunately not that small group, but a faction within the Republican Party in the House. Given the dynamic that you're talking about, does the White House feel like there's anything that the president can do at this point to change that dynamic, or are well, you largely powerless? I think largely you heard the president, heard the president talk uh, today at the business roundtable uh, about the need for uh, common sense to prevail here. Uh, he has made clear that that in both the words that he's spoken and in the proposals that he's made, that he is willing to uh, reach common ground when it comes to budget policy. And uh, he has had numerous conversations with Republican lawmakers uh, in pursuit of that common ground. Uh, at the very least, Congress needs to move forward with a bill that continues uh, the functioning of the federal government and then uh, do what Congress has done hundreds of times in the past uh, without drama and without threat to the economy and simply extend the debt ceiling so that the bills Congress racked up can be paid. The debt ceiling, I know, is, is uh, often viewed as a vote over spending, but it is not. It, is, it doesn't increase the deficit. By raising the debt ceiling, you don't increase the deficit by a dime. You don't add new spending. All you are doing is telling Congress that the bills it's already incurred can be paid, must be paid. And Congress needs to make sure that happens. I guess what I don't understand, though, is I mean, we've heard comments from the President this week. We've heard similar comments from him in previous budget fights. So I guess what I don't understand is, is there anything more than just talking that the President and the White House can do at this point to change this dynamic on the Hill, which at this point seems to make it more likely that we are going to have a shutdown? Well, look, I think, you know, we are uh, speaking out. We are engaging. Uh, uh, in Washington, and you know, we will continue to make the case that uh, while it is absolutely true that we have real differences and and uh, differences that are honestly come by uh, among ourselves between Democrats and Republicans, and we should debate those issues and hash them out and try to reach a compromise. Uh, we cannot hold hostage the full faith and credit of the United States government. We cannot and should not shut down the government in order to make an ideological point. I, thought, I saw one Republican House member quoted in the paper saying, all that matters is that my constituents are for this. And my question to him would be, uh, will they be for it when, in the wake of the devastation of default, uh, they can say, well, I don't have a job because the economy is cratering, but thank God you've taken away my opportunity to buy health insurance. I doubt it. Ahead of the Syria res thing on the Hill, uh, you guys were talking to everybody. Uh, the President was on the phone, Dennis McDonough was up on the Hill. I'm not seeing that in this case. Why, why is that? Again, we have been meeting with Republicans all year long over the, our budget uh, uh, challenges and, and uh, our efforts to f try to find common ground. And we will continue to uh, work with Congress in the days and weeks ahead. But if, I mean, it is to ask the question about. Do you think that meeting with President Obama is going to prevent House Republicans from what they've decided to do, which is to, for the leadership to ignore their own wishes, not to lead, but to then say, we'll follow the will of 40 House Republicans who want to attach the funding of government to a bill that will never pass, never become law, uh, to strip, uh, strip away funding for Obamacare. Uh, you know, that, in the end, Republicans in the Congress need to make a decision about, uh, you know, what outcomes they really desire here. Uh, you know, one provision uh, related to the Affordable Care Act that a Republicans have pressed or said they might press when it comes to raising the debt ceiling right, would increase the deficit, right? Let's remember, the Affordable Care Act reduces the deficit significantly. And you know, trying to uh, repeal it, you know, in a, in, a, in a backhanded way or a side way through delaying a central provision of it, would increase the deficit. So in the name of fiscal conservatism, these Republicans would increase the deficit and call that a victory. It doesn't really square. Well, are you willing to accept any delays in Obamacare in order to avoid a government shutdown? Uh, no. The, 
the, con the Congress passed the Affordable Care Act. The President signed it. The Supreme Court upheld it as constitutional. And uh, it is providing benefits to millions of Americans today and will provide uh, access to affordable health care to millions of Americans when the marketplaces take effect. Uh, you know, Republicans seem to believe, or those that faction of Republicans who have entertained this, seem to believe that taking away those benefits uh, is good messaging, is good politics. Uh, what it is beyond that, if they believe that, is harmful to the people who have those benefits, harmful to our economy. Uh, and, you know, they can, as they have 40 times already, continue to vote to repeal or uh, change or defund the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and we can all watch that exercise as it unfolds, but they should not you know, harm average folks out there uh, in order to participate in that exercise. They should do their jobs by making sure that uh, the essential functions of government are funded and, and making sure that the full faith and credit of the United States government is upheld, as it has been since the birth of the nation. Yes? So are we looking at sort of a gridlock NATO where we could have the government shut down at the end of the month and then go into default a couple of weeks later? Is that a possibility? I, I, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I'm not sure about uh, the, the the NATO part of it, but the Maybe a better term, right? it, it it depends on what uh, what Republicans really want to achieve here, and That's and possible. the government could shut down and then go into default. Well, there's no question that Congress is the body responsible for passing legislation to fund the government, and body responsible for passing legislation to ensure that the debt ceiling is raised. So. Uh, that the bills Congress has already racked up are paid. Uh, so if Congress fails to act, uh, yes, it's possible. Uh, leaders of Congress in both parties have said they would never allow uh, the United States to default. We saw just a few years ago when uh, even the possibility of default was in the air uh, and when some House Republicans uh, enthusiastically flirted with the idea of default, what that meant for our economy. It did harm to our economy, did harm to our recovery. Uh, you know, one can only imagine what would happen if they did it again. Uh, leaders say they don't want that to happen. John Boehner in March told Sean Hannity uh, that he thought it would be, uh, that, that uh, threatening to shut down the government, we're not even talking about default, but shutting down the government over Obamacare was a bad idea. That's what he said in March. Today, uh, he's, uh, you know, I guess reacting to the will of 40 members of the House who insist that it is a good idea. And we know the President has had dinner with various Senate Republicans and met with them privately over the last several months. He, he doesn't do that with House Republican leaders. Has he just given up on dealing with the House? Uh, look, the President has met many times with the Speaker of the House. He's met many times with other uh, members of the House of Representatives of the Republican Party. And but, the but, but, the but, same. but uh, I, again, the president has looked for the president laid forth a budget that represented compromise when it came to entitlement reform, something that Republicans said they want, but they never talk about now because what they really want is to fund Obamacare and take away health insurance options from the American people and maybe raise the deficit at the same time. But that's what they said they wanted. So the president put it forward. He put forward uh, a comprehensive budget proposal that uh, deals with our debt and deficit in the long term while funding important aspects uh, of, in, uh, while providing funds for investments that will help our economy grow, uh, make sure that uh, we're building our infrastructure, educating our children, uh, and uh, conducting research and, sci and, and doing uh, development in a way that keeps our economy competitive. A lot of Democrats did not love that proposal because it represented compromise. It represented uh, a willingness to take less than the ideal by the president, and what we and, and he met. He said, "My door's open. Anybody who wants to meet with me to talk about finding common ground, Republicans, that is, uh, as well as Democrats, are welcome." And and we had a lot of 
constructive meetings. But what we never saw from uh, even the Republicans who said they were interested in common ground was a counter proposal, one that represented the same kind of willingness to compromise that the President had put forward. And that's what the American people expect us to do here. That's what they sent their representatives to do here, was to work out their differences, reach principled compromises, uh, and, and, and take action to ensure that uh, our economy continues to grow and that we're investing in the right places and that we're responsibly reducing our deficit. And, and again, the, the, the deficit arguments are important, uh, but I would point out that you don't hear them a lot anymore from Republicans because the deficit will now be cut in half over the tenure, uh, that the, uh, over the time that the President's been in office. And what do you say to Americans who see this and say, we've, we've seen this movie before, the government did not technically default the last time. Mm -hmm. uh, there hasn't been a shutdown while President Obama has been in office, that this is just sort of Washington theater. Well, I, we certainly hope, and the President certainly hopes, that uh, sooner rather than later, uh, Republican leaders in Congress will be willing to uh, do the right thing and responsibly continue funding of the essential functions of the federal government and, and without drama, as they did earlier this year, extend the debt ceiling. Uh, and then we can continue to negotiate over a broader budget compromise. And they can continue to vote again and again and again to defund or repeal Obamacare in the House as we go about the business of providing uh, expanded opportunities to Americans for, uh, to, to get health insurance. John. Okay, when was the last time the President had a substantive discussion with Speaker of the House John Boehner? I got this question yesterday. I don't have any uh, new conversations to read out to you. Again, I think Speaker Boehner is very much engaged in uh, trying to deal with what everybody in your business has accurately reported as essentially an all-out civil war within the Republican Party, where a faction of the party uh, is basically at odds with the leadership and making demands uh, that if uh, acquiesced to could lead us to a shutdown, or even worse, to a default. So is the White House strategy <clears throat> simply to lean back and watch this, as you call it, Republican No, I think you saw the out. President of the United States meeting with business leaders from this country today, business leaders who have what? no small amount of influence over uh, leaders uh, uh, in Washington, including, you might say, especially Republican leaders, about the need for responsible compromise when it comes to our budgeting, and responsible action by Congress when it comes simply to extending the debt ceiling. Uh, and I think those leaders would tell you that even threatening default uh, is unwise. And even as John Boehner said in March to Sean Hannity, Hannity threatening to shut down the government over Obamacare is a bad idea. I guess the question really is this question of giving up, because... No, we're not. We are making our points every day. See, on, on, on Monday... Points, are you actually talking to Republicans? I mean, you might make the argument, look, they're completely I assume there are some this. watching now. And I, there were a bunch of Republicans in the room with the President today, I'm guessing, right? A bunch. Members of the House? Highly influential, you know, card-carrying Republican Party members who uh, have the ear of... Uh, Republican lawmakers and who believe that Congress ought to do the responsible thing, uh, which is not shut down the government and not allow the government to default. But, but your position, let me just be crystal clear, the President's position is mm -hmm. you will not negotiate over the debt ceiling. Correct. How is that tenable? So the, the White House is really willing to risk default? The White uh, House is not. Here's the thing. You're threatening default. No, no, because, cause, John, because you are. You're, you're saying you won't even negotiate with the Republicans on on this issue. Uh, How is that tenable? <laughs> John, who who has the power to raise the debt ceiling? Well, who uh, has the power to raise the debt ceiling? Well, well, well the Congress who does, has and, the power and, and, and the to raise Congress the debt ceiling. Have put forward a plan. You may call it ridiculous, whatever you want to call it, but they have put forth a plan. The for Congress the has the power to raise the debt ceiling. unwilling to negotiate. I like turning the tables here. I can't get a direct answer. The Congress has the power to raise the debt ceiling. I did answer. <laughs> and, and I said they put and, forward a, a plan. <laughs> all they have to do is do what they have done hundreds of times before and raise the debt ceiling. What is the debt ceiling? The debt ceiling is not new spending. Raising the debt ceiling doesn't add a dime to the deficit. Well, can, can I, I think a lot of, hold on, a lot of the rhetoric around it suggests that it has to do with new spending. But as everyone in this room understands, and everybody on Capitol Hill understands, and, 
And I believe a lot of Americans who are paying attention understands this is, understand this is simply a vote to allow Congress to pay the bills that Congress has already incurred. And that is something we have done as a nation for every year of our existence. So what the President <laughs> has said and what John Boehner periodically has publicly agreed with is that we cannot hold the full faith and credit of the United States government hostage to the ideological desires of a faction of the Republican Party on Capitol Hill. And it is incumbent upon the leaders of that party to ensure that doesn't happen, because uh, though he would like to be able to give direction to uh, members of the Republican Party in the House, the President can't. Uh, hopefully, the elected leaders of that party in the House can. But you're saying you won't even negotiate on the issue. I mean, the debt ceiling's been raised, you're right, I mean, countless times, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, th there's often been a give and take. I mean, not on the debt ceiling. The debt Remind ceiling has me been how Senator Obama voted in 2006 on right. the debt and, ceiling. And we've addressed this many times, and there was never a threat of default then. What the debt ceiling has been attached you, to again and again and again and again at the debt ceiling because Congress didn't like to take the vote, because they knew it was their responsibility to ensure that the debt ceiling would be raised, would attach raising the, the provision that raised the debt ceiling to other bills that were going to pass anyway, and that, would, that is what would happen. And what we had never seen before in our history is what we saw in 2011 when uh, the newly empowered leaders uh, of the Republican Party in Congress insisted that we negotiate over raising the debt ceiling. And we all saw, and you reported on, what happened when they flirted with actual default, as opposed to protest votes, as opposed to uh, attaching the debt ceiling to some other piece of the legislation and holding their noses and voting for it. Uh, this is qualitatively different. There's no arguing that. 2011 was different from any other occasion that we've seen when the debt ceiling has come to a vote, and it had severe economic consequences. We cannot allow that to happen again. The President is willing to negotiate over budget policy. He's willing to negotiate over how we reduce our deficit further moving forward as we've reduced it significantly since he's been in office. But he's not willing uh, to negotiate over Congress's fundamental responsibility not to default on its obligations. Is this just I mean, semantics, though? I mean, he'll be willing to negotiate on those things? No, we have said all along, and we have negotiated all year long over uh, how we pass a budget. Congress, I mean, the Senate said, I mean, the Republicans in the Congress said, as part of the end of the year deal, New Year's Day deal, uh, that they insisted that, that one of their demands was that the Senate pass a budget just as the House had been passing budgets and that normal, regular order would prevail. So we, we said yes. The President said yes. Democratic leaders in the Senate said yes. All of that happened. Uh, and then when it happened and Republicans got what they wanted, they walked away from the process. Uh, so. We're willing and have been willing to negotiate over how we can responsibly reduce our deficit, how we can responsibly uh, reduce the cost of entitlements over time, uh, how we can do all that in a way that's fair and helpful to the middle class. But what we won't do, what the President will not do, what he cannot do, is negotiate over the full faith and credit of the United States. That should be an absolute certitude that Congress will not default. But to return to an earlier point, all he's been doing is talking. Why doesn't he As opposed to what? Arm? Hey, Why Bill, you know what he did? Arm? He wrote a budget. And he proposed it, and he sent it to Congress in detail, detail we have not seen from the Republicans, and in response, in return, in terms of a compromise proposition. And he sat down again and again and again with members of the Republican Party in Congress who said they were interested in trying to find a deal. And we, we, century, it's been known that it's better to be loved than, I mean, feared than loved when it comes to these things. Why is Probably it, prior to that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but why hasn't he done some more in arm twisting, for example? I don't want to go to kneecaps, but arm twisting. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, he's, he, he has twisted arms. He has used uh, uh, the powers that are available to him to try to convince, persuade, cajole Republicans into doing uh, the sensible thing, which is not threatening to shut the government down, not threatening to default, uh, but working with him on a compromise. And what they said they wanted when it came to some of these, uh, some of their demands on entitlement, re entitlement reforms, he gave. And then they walked away and didn't come back. 
so, so at some point, you have to have a negotiating partner who's willing to, uh, if you're willing to compromise, they have to be willing to compromise too. And instead, what we have in the House now is a situation where the House leadership indicates you know, a, a reasonable approach to making sure the government does shuts down, and the rank and file members say no, so the House leadership says never mind. So we're are, not, we cannot, as much as we would like to be, uh, in charge of the House Republicans. We're not, and that's not how the system works. He's not to blame at all. Is it? I, I'm just saying that, that it's his responsibility to, to offer compromises, and he has. Uh, it is also uh, absolutely the right position to take that, that he and no president should negotiate over Congress's responsibility uh, to pay its bills. Or to remain above the fray like that? Again, yeah, uh, you're assuming that he's above the fray. He's not. He's in the fray. <laughs> and he was in the fray today, and he'll be in the fray uh, until Congress with does talk. the right thing. With talk. As opposed to what, Bill? That's what I, mean. I don't think we'll take up arms, okay? I think we're just going to have to, th this is going to have to be worked out, and Congress is going to have to act. Yeah. Jay, uh, when you told John the debt ceiling is never attached to anything, don't you from I that? I said the opposite. You said it's not attached to other issues, that the Congress does it uh, as a stand -alone. I said that in the past, in order to uh, uh, mitigate the unpleasantness of voting for the, raising the debt ceiling, it has been attached to, to other bills that aren't germane, that we're going to pass, so that the debt ceiling has been raised. Sure. But and that has been used as an example by uh, the Speaker of times when the debt ceiling itself, raising the debt ceiling itself, has been negotiated over, which until 2011 had not been the case. Right. But based on 2011 at that podium, you often take credit for $2 trillion in spending cuts the President got that were attached to the last debt ceiling fight. So when you get something you want, it's a good thing. And if it's something about health care or whatever, it's a bad thing. That's the you, you tout that you got $2 trillion in spending cuts, The President put right? forward a proposal to uh, reduce the deficit beyond what was included in that deal. You think that was a good thing? You got no, $2 trillion. we don't think the sequester was a good thing. I'm not talking about sequester. I'm talking sequester about... Sequester was part of that deal. Part of that deal. But you touted again and again. $1.2 trillion in... $1.2 trillion. small part of that. Actually it's not. not but I, you got to go back and check your facts. There was the initial, the initial reduction in non-defense discretionary spending that was part of that deal was roughly $1.2 trillion. Josh, is, am I right along those lines? A trillion bucks. And and that represented a compromise between the President and the Republicans. Uh, then the Supercommittee was tasked with coming up with additional deficit reduction. And if it did not, and if Congress failed to act in the ensuing year to come up with that uh, more responsibly achieved deficit reduction uh, in a balanced way, as the President saw it, then the sequester would kick in. We've never said that the sequester itself was good policy or that we take credit for it. Far from it. The okay. President has long said the right and responsible thing to do uh, would be to reduce our deficit in a balanced way uh, so that the burden of deficit reduction does not fall, fall so solely on the shoulders of the middle class. When you say it's such a bad thing for Republicans to want to delay the health care <clears throat> implementation, the President has delayed pieces of the law, and you've said that was a smart way to do it. Mm -hmm. We need to more slowly implement it, help businesses deal with it. So if the Republicans come up with it, why is it such a bad idea if they say, let's slow walk some pieces of this? When you do it, it's perfectly fine. <laughs> Ed, well, uh, did, right? on the businesses, Ed, you said uh, they can uh, delay. Uh, uh, on the em employer responsibility provision, which represents a very small portion of uh, the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, uh, it was the right and responsible thing to do, reacting in part to the requests of businesses to delay implementation of that for a year. As every Republican who is pushing the idea of delaying implementation of the individual responsibility provision, they know that that is the heart of the Affordable Care Act. It is what is essential to ensuring that Everyone in your extended family who has a pre-existing uh, condition can still get health insurance and isn't blackballed by the insurance companies to making that work, making sure that the uh, individual responsibility provision is there. Furthermore, delaying it would do what? Add to the deficit. So in the name of deficit reduction, Rep uh, Republicans are saying we should add to the deficit even as we're taking away uh, health care for millions of Americans. Seems like a bad idea. You a couple times mentioned that John Boehner in March said that shutting down the government was a bad idea, and now apparently over Obamacare over specifically. Obamacare. Over that specifically. Now he's changed his mind. The president changed his mind on Syria. It wasn't a bad thing. He thought it was smart. Go to Congress. Where? Well, <laughs> I'm just asking. These are the facts you've been presenting every day at this podium for the last couple of weeks. But Ed, he, he what? was not going to go to Congress to vote on Syria. Then he changed his mind. Everyone, everyone here says it's a great idea. He slowed everything down. Uh, John Boehner changed his mind. What's wrong with that? Because shutting down the government over Obamacare is a bad idea. Going to Congress 
to seek an authorization for the use of military force yeah, yeah, yeah. was a good idea, according to hundreds of members of Congress. But he hadn't been able to get it. Uh, there hasn't been a vote. I, no, Ed, I'm not sure the, the arguments you're making. I see oranges and I see apples, okay, but I don't good. see. Let me ask you then, uh, let me ask you about uh, a specific thing on Syria. Last night there was a forum where two of the President's former defense secretaries, uh, Mr. Panetta and Mr. Gates, were there. They both said going to Congress uh, to authorize force was a bad idea, number one. Number two, Mr. Gates said, uh, even though I know previously he's put out a statement saying he supports a mission in Syria, he said that uh, airstrikes would be, quote, throwing gasoline on a very complex fire. And he went on to say, quote, my bottom line is if you blow up a bunch of stuff over a couple of days to validate a point or principle is not a strategy. How do you respond to that, a former defense secretary? Well, I would say two things. One, uh, the president does believe that it was the right thing to do, uh, given that there was not an imminent threat to the United States, uh, given that military action, uh, the success of military action was not dependent on acting immediately, and therefore there was time to allow debate in Congress, that Congress should be consulted, and Congress should uh, be given the right to vote on authorization. The President's been very clear about that. Others uh, can disagree, and that's fine, but the President believes it was the right thing to do. Secondly, it was precisely because of the credible threat of U.S. military action that we saw Syria do an about-face, uh, a nation that had, or a government that had, refused to acknowledge that it even possessed chemical weapons, and for 20 years had refused to be a signatory to the Chemical Weapons Convention, one of the very few nations on Earth to re refuse to sign that, uh, utterly changed its position on both issues within days because of the credible threat of U.S. military action. Uh, the same is true for Russia, which had, uh, prior to uh, their adoption of this proposal to uh, have Syria give up its chemical weapons, turn, it, turn them over to international supervision. Uh, and be signatories to the C, uh, CWC uh, had acted aggressively to block all efforts to hold Assad accountable. Now, there is a diplomatic avenue available to achieving the President's goals that allow, without the use of military force, and the President believes it's the right thing to do to pursue it. That avenue opened up because of the threat of force. And for, the, for that reason, as well as others, it's important to make clear that the threat of force remains on the table. Uh, none of these issues are easy. None of the decisions that a leader makes in these circumstances are obvious or clear. Uh, but I think it is hard to argue that we are not globally in a better place when it comes to Syria's chemical weapons today than we were three weeks ago, when Syria had used chemical weapons against its own people, when Syria denied that it even possessed chemical weapons, when Syria refused to be a signatory to the Chemical Weapons Convention. Uh, and certainly had not even entertained publicly the idea of giving up its chemical weapons. So we have a long way to travel on this road and a lot of work to do and a lot of verica verification to achieve. Uh, but uh, the positions the President took uh, helped bring us to this point, uh, which is a better point uh, than where we were in the past. JNBC's Ann Curry sat down for an exclusive interview with Iran's President Rouhani today in Tehran. I know we addressed this briefly yesterday, but I just want to follow up and make sure I get it on the record again today. Does the President have any plans to meet with the Iranian President during the United Nations uh, meetings in New York? There are week? currently no plans uh, for the President to meet with President Rouhani at the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, you know, I think it's uh, fair to say that the President believes there is an opportunity for diplomacy. Uh, when it comes to the issues that uh, have uh, presented challenges to the United States and our allies uh, with regards to Iran. And we hope that the Iranian government takes advantage of this opportunity. We have heard a lot in the world uh, from President uh, Rouhani's administration about its desire to improve uh, the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran's relations with the international community. And President Obama believes we should test that assertion. And, and we are and we will do that. As you know, the President mentioned in, in an interview uh, with George Stephanopoulos that uh, he and President Rouhani have exchanged letters. Uh, and in his letter, the President indicated that the U.S. is ready to resolve the nuclear issue in a way that allows Iran to demonstrate that its nuclear program is for exclusively peaceful purposes. The letter also conveyed the need to act with a sense of urgency to address this issue because, as we have long said, 
the window of opportunity for resolving this diplomatically is open, but it will not remain open indefinitely. Yeah, in that uh, event that was held last night, the former Defense Secretary Leon Panetta also said that the President should have directed limited action in Syria. He went on to say that Iran is paying very close attention to what we're doing. There's no question in my mind they're looking at the situation and what they are seeing is an element of weakness. Is Leon Panetta wrong in that and, assessment? Well, I would say a couple of things. No, I have enormous respect. The President has enormous respect and appreciation for both of his former Secretaries of Defense. But as your two questions noted, they actually disagree on this issue, which only reinforces the fact that these are not easy decisions to make or easy positions to take. Uh, the President believes that the credible threat of military force uh, was important and remains important, and that it has brought about this potential for a diplomatic resolution. Uh, he believes it was the right thing to do, to go to Congress for authorization uh, prior to the diplomatic breakthrough. Uh, and uh, he understands that others can differ with that view, that others might say the, he or any president should have deployed mil military force without going to Congress. The president believed, uh, consistent with the principles he's espoused since he was a candidate for president, that given the fact that there was not an imminent threat to the United States, uh, and given that the military response that uh, he was calling for could be uh, executed successfully, even if there was a delay allowing for a congressional debate, that it was the right thing to do to go to Congress. He understood and made clear when he made his announcement in the Rose Garden that this would be a tough debate. Uh, and uh, that does not take away from the fact that it was a good debate and the right debate to have. Briefly on the topic of the shooting that took place only a few miles from here at the Navy Yard, uh, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Martin Dempsey, today said that those who have served in the military shouldn't be stigmatized by having to answer questions about uh, their mental health status on security clearance forms. Acknowledging there's a review in place right now, what's the President's position on whether there should be greater mental health checks done, more information provided by people that want to become contractors in that form? Well, there is a review uh, taking place, one that has been ongoing uh, with regard to some contractors that uh, is being undertaken by the ODNI, and then another that is being uh, undertaken by uh, the Office of Management and Budget here at the President's direction. Uh, and I wouldn't want to uh, dictate what the outcomes of that review should be. Uh, there's obviously an issue broadly speaking, separate from matters of clearances, but broadly speaking when it comes to gun violence, there's an issue uh, that is important to examine uh, when it comes to mental health. And that was uh, something the President talked about when he put forward his uh, comprehensive plan to reduce gun violence, and it is something that he believes is important to talk about today. Uh, how that plays into security clearances and uh, work clearances for contractors, I think, uh, we should wait and see once these reviews are done. Um, given what you've described as the obstructionist bent of, uh, that we've seen from some congressional Republicans, would you say that the, does the President believe that the best way to achieve his second term goals might be through the midterm elections and putting a Democratic, getting a Democratic Congress uh, in the The House? President is not waiting to achieve any of these goals, to push for the achievement of any of these goals that uh, help create a better bargain for the middle class, that help make the middle class stronger through uh, broad economic growth and job creation, through education investment and uh, investment in research and development and uh, new energy and infrastructure. So, uh, you know, he hasn't, he's put forward these proposals, he's put forward his comp uh, compromise proposals on the budget, and he's continued to press uh, leaders in Congress to take him up in discussion and debate about moving forward on these issues. Uh, yeah, that includes his, his uh, tax reform proposal, coupling corporate tax reform with <coughs> investments uh, in infrastructure uh, and job creation. Uh, so he's, he's, he's throwing out ideas to try to see if he can move the ball forward when it comes to growing our economy, and he's going to continue doing that. Uh, you know, a term in office for the President uh, may to some seem like a long time, four years, but uh, there is much work to be done and he's not going to wait for uh, elections or uh, 
uh, you know, changes in the seasons to, to try to move forward. That's, you know, he has been pushing this ball uh, uphill sometimes, frequently, uh, from the day he took office. And, and as we've noted on this five-year anniversary of the financial collapse, there has been a great deal achieved. Uh, you know, that remembering where we were five years ago is to almost you know, reinsert yourself into a nightmare. Uh, when you think back about uh, the fears that everyone uh, was dealing with in September of 2008 and for the next 18 months, really, uh, at least. And, 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 it's, and it's important as we do that to remember that Many millions of Americans are still struggling, and we need to make the right decisions to, insert, to, in, uh, to make sure that the economy grows and uh, more good-paying middle-class jobs are created. Seven and a half million is a lot, but it is not nearly enough. We need to press on. Anybody? Yeah. All right. Um, earlier this year, the president had a real- When do you go to London? Uh, okay. January. <laughs> Got me for a few more months yet. All right. Well, I'll um, make sure I get an invitation to the going away party. Absolutely. Uh, the president had a real charm offensive with Republicans. He took them to dinner, he paid out of pocket, he went to a nice restaurant. Is <laughs> the difference between that approach a few months ago and this sort of going to business leaders and, and speaking publicly instead of courting Republicans in person, does that reflect a sense in the White House that the charm offensive failed, that, that the wooing them didn't work? Uh, we have tried and we will try uh, all manner uh, of ways to get to yes with Republican leaders when it comes to doing the responsible thing uh, on budget policy and on raising the debt ceiling and on a bunch of other issues like immigration reform. I mean, I think that while it was notable that the President uh, footed the bill for a very expensive dinner at a very nice restaurant in a uh, lovely hotel up the street here, there were many other meetings uh, with the President and with the Chief of Staff and with the Vice President and others. Uh, with lawmakers uh, well into the year and, uh, you know, all around this effort of trying to find common ground. And I think that what we discovered is that there is a sincere desire by uh, Republican lawmakers, some of them anyway, and not an insignificant number of them, uh, to try to work out a way to uh, make budget policy that, and economic policy that reduces the deficit responsibly but invests uh, responsibly as well uh, and in a way that is fair to the middle class. Uh, and, and, you know, the President remains hopeful that, you know, those uh, members who sincerely want to achieve that will be able to, working with him and working with Democrats. Uh, in the meantime, you know, we're going to keep pressing, uh, at the very least when it comes to these deadlines, that uh, Washington not uh, inflict harm on the economy. You know, we may not be able to achieve the, the big deal when it comes to uh, a long-term budget with Congress between now and October 1st, but uh, we certainly shouldn't therefore uh, allow, and the Republicans in the House should not insist upon shutting down the government uh, over that or over the fact that Obamacare is the law of the land and it's being implemented and it's been upheld by the Supreme Court and it's providing benefits to millions of people. You know. You know, I understand that they, we understand that they, you know, those Republicans who are, feel adamantly about this oppose the law and uh, they've campaigned on it and they've uh, talked about it and they've voted on it, but they should not then pair it with shutting down the government or defaulting on our obligations. Yeah. Phil. Jay, uh, two questions. First on Kathy Rumler. Does mm -hmm. the President have any opinion on her leaving? Is there any kind of timetable to replace her in the council's office? And well, I, I, I can confirm that she uh, will be leaving at the end of the year, so she's here for uh, a, a good bit longer. And, uh, you know, that the uh, president had asked her to stay uh, on as long as she has and will, and, and that she is an enormous asset and a very important advisor to the president and uh, one of the smartest uh, people I've ever met. And, and one of the best people I've ever worked with. So uh, we will all be sad to see her go when she goes. Uh, beyond that, I have no, uh, you know, information to provide as ever 
on personnel decisions by the has, president. Has he identified a successor, or is this going to again? I have no uh, no information to divulge on that matter or any other personnel matter. And on immigration, um, <laughs> as long as you're asking, <laughs> well, you wanted to ask uh, on immigration. Uh, yesterday, the president said in a Telemundo interview that he was not going to use executive authority to delay um, deportations of illegal immigrants. Some immigration advocates wish he would do more uh, while Congress is still sort of kind of stalled out on this bill. Well, what the president has made clear is that you know comprehensive immigration reform is the way to resolve our immigration challenges. And when it comes to uh, this matter of deportations and, and the idea that there's a plan B available to him, he said yesterday in the interview that you cited that it's not an option. Uh, he said, quote, that to do so would be ignoring the law in a way that I think would be very difficult to defend legally. That's not an option. Uh, you know, if John Boehner, going back to the Speaker of the House, would put the Senate Comprehensive Immigration Bill on the floor of the House today, it would pass and the President would sign it. We're confident of that. Uh, there is a majority, not only in the nation, but even in Congress, to achieve this important piece of legislation that would grow our economy and reduce our deficit. It would uh, provide a system to allow for the best and the brightest from uh, who other countries who study here to stay here and start businesses here and would uh, ensure that everybody is playing by the same set of rules whether it's employers or uh, people working in the United States that they're paying their taxes and contributing uh, to the common good so uh, we the president believes that <coughs> The House ought to do that. He is entirely confident that comprehensive immigration will form, will pass, will become law, and that he will be the one who signs it into law. And the House ought to do it right away and uh, maybe address some of the political challenges that they've uh, been encountering lately by doing so. Yes. Um, does the, jumping back to Aaron Alexis, uh, does the White House have any sense for how sequestration and budget cuts are affecting, have affected the background? clearance check process, and has that had any impact on, on this case? Uh, I would point you to the investigation uh, and, and the FBI to, who were making assessments about this particular case. Uh, and I, you know, I'm not, sh I'm, I'm not aware of, uh, of any impacts one way or the other of sequestration on uh, background check systems or security systems. You know, these are all under review as a general matter uh, by the DNI and by the OMB uh, and, and I, I imagine uh, that, that that piece of it will be taken into account. Thanks, Jeff. Steve. Thanks. Um, Mr. Netanyahu said yesterday that the way to end the Iranian nuclear crisis was for Iran to stop enriching uranium, to ship out uranium that is enriched out the country, to close to them and to stop plutonium activity. The President yesterday said in his interview that the way for it to end would be for Iran not to weaponize its nuclear program. Does that not show that despite the, the good feeling of the President's trip to Israel earlier this year that the two sides are still, you know, deeply divided on the fundamental way no, to stop No, I, I don't think, I mean, both, both, both are ways for Iran to uh, resolve its, uh, you know, its obligations to the international community when it comes to nuclear weapons. Uh, any, any resolution would have to come through a, you know, a verifiable compliance and a verifiable commitment by Iran to give up its nuclear weapons ambitions. That has long been our position. Uh, so again, we're, we're ready to talk in the P5 plus one as well as bilaterally with Iran uh, if Iran is willing to um, engage substantively on this matter. Libby, yeah. For the first time, an Indian American winning the Miss America pageant. Uh, I haven't spoken about it with him, so I don't have his thoughts. But I, I think it's great personally. But is he aware about the racial slurs he's facing after he won the BBC? I'm sorry. Is he aware about uh, the racial uh, hatred he's Again, facing? Again, I haven't. I haven't uh, discussed that with him, so I don't have a presidential response. Uh, thank you all very much.